Hello, my name is Noel Bell. I'm a psychotherapist based in London, and this is a podcast with Keith Wilson, a licensed mental health counsellor based in Rochester, New York State. We'll be discussing Keith's uh, published works, most notably his recent book, The The Road to Reconciliation, a comprehensive guide to peace when relationships go bad. So Keith, Yes. Great to have this opportunity to have a chat. You're based in the great state of New York, um, up, upstate New York, right? Upstate New York in Rochester, right along the shores of Lake Ontario. Sounds sounds wonderful. So um, we've already outlined the the books you've um, written, and um, there's. I mean, I guess just to bring us into context, we're talking about, uh, you know, there's great religious traditions of uh, forgiveness. Uh, the 12-step community talk massively about the, the, the need to uh, deal with the f- resentments. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so much of the world, I guess, today in a geopolitical sense, there's so much strife and um, everyone's uh, at each other as never before, it seems. So the need mm-hmm. for reconciliation, I think, is everywhere. Uh, so, so what really drew you to focus in on this particular aspect of the work? Or, or, or is it that this is the work and why would you do anything else? Mm-hmm. Uh, I consider myself very much a generalist. I just see uh, adults, but I try not to specialize in anything because you never know what kind of problem a person is going to have when they walk in your door. Um, But I found that over the years, uh, what everybody has in common, uh, no matter whether they have a psychosis or depression or anxiety or an addiction or what have you, um, one thing they all have in common is they have broken relationships. Uh, Relationships that often get broken because of the condition, or sometimes the condition comes about as a result of of this uh, social stress. Um, But I found that this is one thing that they all have in common. And um, years ago, uh, I quit my job for a community mental health clinic and started a private practice. And anybody who's done that probably knows you have a lot of time on your hands for a while while you're waiting for clients to arrive at your door. Uh, So I started to um, uh, try some other things. I um, got trained as a facilitator for a, a restorative justice project. Um, here in in Rochester. Uh, Restorative justice is where uh, when you have somebody who's charged with a crime rather than sending them to jail or putting them on probation or that sort of thing, you put them in touch with the victim and you have the two of them work work out um, um, what had happened uh, and and you try to help the offender make amends. Mm -hmm. So I um, learned how they go about doing this, and I thought I might try some of this with some of my clients, Um, but I found that there was a a problem, and that is when you're dealing with restorative justice in the community, you have usually one person who is clearly the offender and the other one is clearly the victim. Uh, And that is not the case most of the time when you're dealing with ongoing relationships. It's a whole lot more complicated than that. So um, I I thought a great deal about this problem of offender versus victim and decided that uh, really we're all both. And um, in order to really... uh, truly deal with whatever harm was done to you or you have done, it is necessary to slow down quite a bit and sort out um, these two roles because quite often offenders uh, commit their offense out of a sense of being victimized. 
And so if you don't deal with their sense of victimization, then uh, they don't know what uh, the precipitants are for them to reoffend. Yeah. So I, I like to slow this down and take a look at the aspects in which both the victim and the offender, um, as they identify themselves, are really both. Um, and so then I developed this way of, of working uh, with people. Um, it, it, when we're dealing with um, issues like this, uh, a lot of moral quandaries come up and it's really necessary to think these through uh, beforehand and, and try to figure out what your general approach might be. Uh, so I began to write the book as in a, as a way of doing that, thinking through uh, some of these problems. Sure. And so, so Keith, from a, uh, a theoretical point of view framework, what I'm hearing there is, um, I guess, some of the stuff around uh, victim, rescuer, perpetrator, the Karpman stuff, or based on, you know, that followed transactional analysis. Where, 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 I, you know, I don't pretend that all this work I've done is is entirely original. Uh, it is certainly oh, no. based so, on... So I'm just curious, lot of, lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Did, did that inform your um, way of working? Um, yes, it did. It, it, uh, that um, s different bits of structural family therapy, um, Bowen and, and that uh, theorists like that in, inform my, my theory. Um, and also uh, working with um, addicts and who, who had exposure to AA and NA. Um, uh, the, the, the clients themselves taught me a great deal about about working with these problems. Sure. So, so you as a practitioner, have you sort of? It sounds like you're fairly integrative and holistic, which uh, sounds great. And mm -hmm. how best to meet the needs of your clients? Um, what 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 were you particularly drawn to in your extensive training? Uh, during my training, I, I would have to say I was drawn to uh, systems therapy. Um, and um, and also drawn to um, Rogerian client-centered uh, therapy, uh, which um, my earliest supervisors did their best to try to train out of me in, in working with, with addicts and alcoholics. Uh, but uh, I, I, guess, I guess I learned too much in, in college. I, I, I couldn't just be a friend. <laughs> sure. So, so Keith, my personal experience informs obviously a lot of the way I, I work and what I'm particularly drawn on to. That's just probably stating the obvious. And my client experience working in this field of trying to help people psychologically and spiritually and emotionally, um, what I've come across from numerous people from different settings, all ages, um, different backgrounds, different cultures, is um, some people will encounter feeling or are actually ostracized either from a community uh, or a profession or more kind of pertinently probably their own family of origin and mm -hmm. um, the need for reconciliation and perhaps forgiveness is massive and can be very crucial but my question for you would be what have you encountered as the kind of blockers to that reconciliation process? You know, I'm thinking of toxic families, which are used to maybe scapegoating people. So the scapegoated person, how do they reconcile with and get into a spirit of forgiveness in what they perceive to be a toxic environment? Hopefully that's not too long a question. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, there are many barriers to reconciliation. Um, the first comes with, um, first of all, when you are the one who is victimized or to the extent that you are victimized, the first barrier is uh, to recognize that you are the victim. Um, there's a great deal of people who have a, a, a lot of trouble in acknowledging that they have been harmed by somebody that they have loved. And in failing to acknowledge this, then they, they also fail to, to, to deal with this and to um, work with the offending loved one uh, in a way to, to affect some change. Uh, th then if a person succeeds in, in acknowledging that they're the victim, then they often fall prey to maybe becoming overly vindictive and, and becoming an, an offender themselves, driving um, other people away. So um, you, can, you can go off the road in both directions um, in, in, in this. Um, then uh, there's often the problem where uh, victims uh, forgive too quickly. While we want people to be pointed towards forgiveness, um, uh, we don't necessarily want them to forgive before they've really adequately um, taken a look at what they're forgiving them for um, and, and, and what, the, what the problem is. Um, quite often people forgive before they adequately take a look at the entire context behind the offense. Uh, and then there are problems with, with uh, once you uh, recognize that, that you have harmed somebody that you loved. Um, denial works there, obviously, as well. Um, people are ridden with a great deal of shame uh, that prevents them from doing the work uh, very openly. And then once you do all this work, which incidentally is really personal work, it's not done so much with, with the loved one who harmed you, it's done um, within yourself as a victim or as an offender. Once you do all that work um, and you get to the place where you can really deal with the person themselves, um, one person always arrives at that spot before the other one. Um, yeah, um, and, and, and a lot of times um, uh, you have a loved one who will never really be able to reconcile because they lack the maturity or they've uh, fallen prey to one or more of these, um, these problems that befall both um, victims and offenders. So it, it's really quite um, remarkable whenever uh, two people do truly reconcile. Usually the best that you can hope for is just achieving a sense of personal peace um, that uh, in, in which you come to some peace about being a victim, about being an offender, um, and changing things, but without ever really um, uh, completely reconciling with the person that, that harmed you. Yes, no, that's, that's very interesting, Keith, yeah. And I mean, my tr initial training was uh, intricate to transpersonal. So I was looking at um, embracing lots of different, you know, psychodynamic, humanist, TA stuff, but, but also having a wrapper of um, psycho-spiritual uh, development. So looking at people like Ken Wilbur, who talked about the pre-trans fallacy and that point which i think is very pertinent forgiving too quickly um you know i've met a lot of people who will say they've been on spiritual retreats and are super reconciled with past wounding but they're not they're, they're, their smile is true gritted teeth they're still mm -hmm. suffering and screaming inside and the source of their wounding still gets replicated in all their current relationships, be it at work or in personal life. So mm -hmm. that thing about forgiving too quickly, I think that's really um, important part 
of this work that people have to feel their pain and understand the wounding that they've had perhaps in order to really uh, be ready to make changes mm -hmm. yes yes very true uh, however i want to underscore what i said earlier that it is important to be pointed in that direction um and and maybe maybe what um might make sense would be to um begin with a provisional uh, forgiveness <laughs> a forgiveness that, that that remains open to being um shown that the offender is changing something uh but yet doesn't trust completely um, uh, yeah. so uh, a, a victim might might um offer this provisional uh forgiveness and and put their put their loved one on probation so to speak um yeah, for sure. And, and in your experience, when does the person who feels victimized uh, become aware or takes responsibility for acknowledging their part? Well, that is a very delicate operation right there, yeah. um, because uh, we don't want to get involved with, with victim blaming. Um, one thing that we have to get past is the tendency to create uh, what I call uh, an official story. Um, we're all familiar with the governments and corporations' versions of official stories. They put out these official statements sometimes, um, which don't really answer questions, but they serve to stop questions from being asked. Yeah. So when some terrible thing has happened in a relationship, uh, quite often the victim and the offender will choose some official story to, to cover what, what has happened. And, and it serves to per, perhaps save face or to preserve um, uh, some aspects of the relationship. Um, but to the extent that they believe and propagate the official story, they never look uh, beyond that. So um, when I work with offenders, uh, I, I usually start by uh, thoroughly assessing the damages of, of, um, of what has happened. Um, I have them take a look at the flip side, why they're in the relationship in the first place. And then I have them um, arrive at some recognition of what can never really be hurt. And what can never be hurt is the uh, ability to choose what you think about all this stuff. Um, what, the, what the ancient Greeks called uh, proheresis, although they may have pronounced it differently. <laughs> um, and and, and this, is, this is the ability to, to choose, uh, you know, if you're being harmed, whether it, it's the ability to choose how you feel. So once we do that, then I, I have them take a look at um, the context behind what has happened um, and try to take a look at the big picture, all of the other uh, factors that went into this. And I'm very careful not to call them explanations or reasons or justifications for why the offender did what they did but simply I, I call it context and and i try to take this very neutral stance like this um in an effort to draw out of the the victim um whatever their contribution uh, might have been and sometimes this contribution is how they maybe offended the offender <laughs> and caused the, the offender to um, um to, to strike back, and, and that striking back is the offense we're dealing with here. Or sometimes uh, the, the victim uh, becomes vindictive and becomes an offender after the offense. Uh, or sometimes the offense is actually forgiving too quickly uh, so that uh, um, nobody ever really gets a chance to, to see what has happened and, and, and to change things. Um, 
So uh, that's that's what I try to do to have uh, victims uh, take a look at the big picture. And quite often they come away from there with some awareness that, uh, yeah, they, they contributed somewhat either before the offense or, or afterwards. And, yeah. uh, and, and uh, then this often helps them uh, become much more humble and willing to, uh, to work with the, the offender. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I mean, a lot of the current uh, knife crime ac- epidemic seems to be po- in London and probably a, a lot of parts around the world um, is showing that, that, you know, victims have been offenders and offenders will be victims. And outside of that cohort of people involved in that extreme violence, um, it's like a different world. So I'm just wondering, just on that, what, you know, constructive conflict, what, 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 I was just looking at your website, looking at that piece on constructive conflict. Do you want to explain what constructive conflict is? Uh, constructive conflict, um, I believe, if you take any two people and put them together, um, one person is always going to be different from the other one. Uh, one person is always going to be neater. Uh, one much more connected with their family. What one will be always much more uh, um, generous. Uh, one will be tighter with the budget. So one will be uh, more interested in sex. Um, you always have a difference of, of that sort, no matter what two people that you put together. Um, when you put them together and they uh, are willing to understand the other person's point of view, um, then this strengthens their, their, the, the lives of, of both of them overall. It, it, just like having two eyes gives you perspective. Um, uh, having two people in a relationship gives you another kind of perspective. But they have to be able to share these perspectives in a way that's respectful and um, and and accurate to their own their, their own perspective. Uh, a lot of couples shy away from that kind of thing. They are uh, afraid of conflict, or the only time that they have conflict, it becomes um, it becomes explosive and, and damaging. So. Um, I, I try to work with people to to have their conflicts, but but to have them uh, constructively uh, by creating some regulations around their conflict, um, so that um, any of their conflicts don't, don't explode and destroy the both. Yeah. So so um, I'm just wondering, you know, like when you talked about. Um, the barriers to reconciliation, um, practically speaking, someone listening to this um, might have uh, historical resentments, um, feeling ostracized from key relationships or networks or family. Um, I guess it's a big question, but so how do you make an apology? Hmm. Uh, if you believe that you've harmed somebody, um, then uh, the way I, I work with people to make an apology is, is I, I first have them write up a statement of responsibility, uh, which is a document that they are just writing for themselves uh, to share with me. Um, and in this statement of responsibility, I ask them to state uh, quite plainly and quite uh, completely whatever they believe they did wrong. Um, now, sometimes this is not what the victim might say they did wrong, but I'm, I'm dealing with the, the the offender there and and trying to tap into their own sense of uh, of morality here. Um, and then I have them 
uh, write about uh, all of the possible consequences of this wrongdoing, uh, anything that could have arisen from it. And then I have them write about what they could have done differently. And once they do all that, and we discuss whether this would be uh, harmful or helpful to uh, talk to the victim about, then I coach them into uh, uh, delivering this this um, this apology um, by stating what they are responsible for by um, uh, stating what they imagine were the uh, the results of it and and then by um, um, saying what, what they could have done differently. And then generally out of whatever they say they could have done differently, then we construct a, um, uh, a way of making amends. Now, uh, amends can be very difficult to imagine because once you do something, it's very difficult to undo them. But what we're really trying to do with making amends is trying to prevent uh, a reoccurrence of whatever the offense was. Uh, so I have them pick out something that they can do every single day that if they do this, would the natural result would be that they would not um, they would not commit another offense. Um, for example, I once worked with a man who once every few months he would um, flip out, he would have a temper tantrum and punch holes in the walls and upturn furniture and scare the bejeebers out of his entire family. And he felt very sorry for doing this. He swore that he would never do it again. Uh, but here's the thing, he could go for years never doing it again, and the family would never know whether it was going to happen tomorrow or not, uh, because it doesn't happen very often. Um, so sw swearing that they're never going to do it again or, or making amends by, you know, patching the wall, the holes in the walls and that sort of thing uh, doesn't really help a great deal. Um, what he was finally able to do is learn to every day uh, sit down with his family members and tell them how he feels um, in a respectful kind of way. Um, and most of the time, this is 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 very ordinary, undramatic feelings. And <laughs> but when he does this every single day, then uh, it prevents uh, the, the big blowups from from happening. Um, so, in this way, him talking every single day was his way of making amends. And if you encounter uh, people who've suffered from trauma, from, um, well, I suppose for this, it was more likely family trauma when they were younger that has mm -hmm. created the strife and then hence the need for reconciliation. How, how would you work with historical trauma? Well, first of all, I would work with the traumatized person by themselves um, before ever trying to work with them and the offender or encouraging them to approach the offender. Um, and then what I generally focus more on is not so much the trauma as the re-trauma. And by re-trauma, I mean what happens to you when you um, are reminded or triggered of the original trauma. Um, for example, a woman who is raped on her college campus and she watches a TV show in which something like that happens. What does she do then? Does she shut down? Does she feel bad about herself? Does she uh, get in the car and drive 100 miles over an hour? Does she drink? Um, those kinds of things, which she is doing to herself, um, can actually create uh, far more problems than the original trauma itself. Uh, so I, I first, before I ever ask anybody to talk to me in any detail about their trauma, I have them talk about 
how they get re-traumatized whenever it's talked about. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then when we get a grip on that, um, quite often, really, that's the only work we really need to do. Because if, if you are uh, reminded of your trauma and then are fine with it and, and don't react in all these kinds of ways, then really, what, what's the problem anymore? Um, so that, that's really the focus of, of the work I, I'm doing, um, often with, with victims. So this is work that they do for themselves um, uh, individually. Then if they are in an ongoing relationship with this person who traumatized them, then we, well, we first want to see if they are safe currently. Um, and if they're not, then I, I work with them to try to achieve some kind of safety because there's um, no sense in trying to work towards any sense of personal peace if you're not feeling safe. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, so, so we we, we try to um, help them move towards safety, and then once they're in a in a safe place, if the offending person is capable of doing this uh, restorative uh, justice kind of work, then I might work with that person to uh, develop an apology and, and make amends and that that sort of thing. Yeah. So. Keith, what would you then say to, um, I mean, I'm not trying to be devil's advocate here as such. Mm -hmm. uh, it is kind of based on um, case studies that I'm being familiar with of people who might intellectually agree with you that it's good to mm -hmm. reconcile and to end and overcome resentments. And to engage in forgiveness they'll agree with you but they will say the people that they're in conflict with or had been in conflict with they just don't like and they don't see them as capable of real engagement with or taking responsibility for their behavior and that the best mm -hmm. thing for them is just to walk away and not mm -hmm. seek to reconcile. What, what would you say to that viewpoint? I, I would say walk away by all means. Uh, it doesn't sound like this is a terribly safe relationship um, to be in. Uh, and by walking away, <clears throat> what, we're, what we really mean is renegotiating the relationship. Uh, one point I make to people is that once you are in a deep, profound, uh, intimate relationship with somebody, you will always be in relationship with that person. Even if you never see them again, there's still going to be figures in your head um, that you relate to. Um, so it, it, is, it is really never a question of, of ending a relationship because I don't think ending relationships is even possible. What is possible, though, and what happens all the time in any normal relationship is a renegotiation of the relationship so that the terms of how we relate to one another uh, change. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, this happens all the time in a uh, parent-child relationship. When you're a child, your uh, mother changed your diaper, okay? Uh, when you become an adult, uh, you wouldn't have her do that anymore. She probably even needs to knock when she visits you at your home. Um, so that, that's a, a relationship that has been renegotiated. So if you're in a relationship with somebody who has harmed you, uh, it makes sense to create some space and, and, and um, don't put yourself in, in, in a position where you can be harmed again but you may want to still continue some sort of relationship that feels safe. And maybe this involves sending a Christmas card once a year uh, just to, to maintain contact, or maybe it's a little bit more than that. Um, but I, I, I believe it is necessary for people to, to sometimes walk away. Um, 
And and just on that, if the risk is there's an ongoing unresolved emotional conflict with that individual by not being able to reconcile, is there any what do you well, what do you think is the in the legacy of that unresolved emotional conflict in that person's life? Well, uh, then what you have is is problems taking over in that relationship. Uh, for example, a um, an active um, alcoholic who has harmed their family, but their them and their family remain all together, uh, and he remains drinking. Um, the, the the drinking then becomes uh, almost a, a another party there in the relationship of uh, the, the, the alcohol, and so um, I, I I then counsel people to distinguish between the person and the problem. Uh, for example, the the, the alcoholic husband. Um, his alcoholism and everything that arises from it is the problem, and then there's the person, um, which they may have some glimpses of every now and then. Um, and then I <clears throat> work with them to try to identify how they can uh, create problem-free zones um, in their life. So areas of their life where the problem is not likely to affect. Uh, and so um, they uh, build those problem-free zones and then they often are able to live quite satisfactorily um, having those kinds of things and keeping the, the problem somewhat at bay from uh, not uh, causing complete catastrophe in, in their lives. Yeah. Uh, for example, um, the, the wife of such an alcoholic husband might want to have separate checking accounts or um, not uh, clean up after her husband when he comes home uh, intoxicated and barfs all over the living room rug and that kind of thing. Or maybe have the, 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 the husband uh, have a separate bedroom or that, that sort of thing. And that's all ways of creating uh, problem-free zones. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting uh uh, tool to get people to create that list. Um, so, Keith, your books are available on, on Amazon. Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Yeah. So, is there if if we finish up, is there any question um, I didn't ask you that you would have liked to get asked? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, one thing we didn't really uh, talk too much about is um, uh, codependency. Yeah. Um, and, and how sometimes when a victim is harmed, they, um, in, in, in my view, they um, are uh, a great deal of the, the, the meaning and the purpose of their life is in uh, living with the person and dealing with the person who continues to harm them. Uh, look, at, at, we all need meaning and purpose in our lives. And so there's uh, limiting ways of getting that. We can try to cure cancer or achieve world peace, or we can find a screwed up person and try to take care of them. And um, <clears throat> there's plenty of screwed up people out there and um, it's pretty easy to uh, achieve meaning and purpose by finding them and taking care of them. And the more screwed up they are, the more meaningful it is to take care of them. And the more impossible it is to take care of them, the more meaningful it is to take care of them. Uh, because you are being heroic at that point and you are doing something that nobody else would ever do. So, uh, many victims derive so much of their um, sense of meaning from from um, from doing this kind of thing that they continue to uh, subject themselves to, to harm and and, uh, and and the offender continues to, to do what he or she does um, 
without ever ever being checked. Yes, and and so your book deals with the goes into dealing with codependency and how to recover from codependency. Yeah, uh, in 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 my uh, chapter on on um, when problems take over a relationship. I, I, I dislike using the word codependency, however, because I think it's, it's being overused. And, and, I, I, and what I try to do in, in that case and many other cases is try to take a uh, fresh look at it um, and, and, uh, and explain it somewhat differently. Yeah, because it's interesting. It, it, it was, I think it was originally called relationship addiction, wasn't it? And then codependency yeah. was supposed yeah. to be the thing that was more explanatory, but now it's been overused. Well, the words are like that. We have to refresh them every now and then, so we uh, retain the original meaning. Yeah. 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 Well, Keith, it's been um, a pleasure to chat, and um, I'm sure people will be very interested in accessing your um, your books and um, yeah do a good search for Keith Wilson books on Amazon and there'll be a book winging its way to you by <laughs> remote helicopter or by regular mailman very soon or mail person that's right it was a pleasure being on your show and uh, wish you luck in the future Thank you very much, Keith.